if at all available for only parts of the collection someone was in particular interested in or maybe type specimens. And here are two examples. This is from our own museum, the Anthropological Research Museum in Riverside. So we have pretty obviously on our web page accessible databases of certain groups of insects that we're particularly interested in, had projects on them. And then this is actually quite exceptional, um, at least in the insect world still, unfortunately. The American Museum of Natural History has a type specimen database that it made um, it became available about 10 years ago, I think. And it's not only lists not only all the type specimens, but it also shows images of the great majority of them. So obviously, this is a great resource. And you go, well, we all should have that, right? Every museum should have that, because that would make everyone's lives so much easier. The other thing is that what in many cases would give us a good idea of what's in a museum would be just to have simple overviews of drawers, but even that is in most cases not available. Okay, so well, one way of dealing with that is obviously the, as I would call it, community-based solutions. So for example, for some of the projects I've worked on for Red Wheels in particular, whenever I go get a chance to go visit a collection, I just make a simple overview picture of the drawer. That's not good enough to see the um, information on the insect specimen, but then what I would typically do is I take four closer up pictures, and I do that with a real simple um, Nikon camera, so nothing fancy out there really. And then when you look at the quality of the specimens, uh, the specimen images and the labels, not perfect, but it, it does actually help. And we're making that available to other people working on red vids out there worldwide. And it starts helping us really to know what's where, what's in which collection. Okay, okay then obviously we say specimen should be prepared, curated, and identified. Um, but of course, this is often not feasible, right? Especially in the big collections that have accessions coming in all the time, big biodiversity inventory type projects, that becomes very difficult. So in many cases, collections will have what we call bulk sample collections. We also call stuff like that insect soup, because this is really what it looks like. It comes in big jars usually, and it's just lots of insects floating in there. Um, that's the reality. This is what happens. Um, in certain cases, and the Field Museum is an ex exceptional case, um, in this case, they um, actually have a database, at least, of all the bulk samples. So you can at least get a rough idea on what types of samples are out there. Obviously, still people have to come in and sort the specimens and pull out what they're interested in to make that eventually available as biodiversity data. <coughs> Specimen identification, obviously a problem, but I will talk about it later at <coughs> some point. Okay, and then obviously data sharing is important. So, um, in some cases, borrowed specimens, so when we do work on a project, we borrow specimens from other institutions. They already come with an electronic file that has georeference localities and so on and so forth. That's obviously a great thing because it saves a lot of time. We would not ever recapture this data, obviously. It sounds like a great idea, but it virtually never happens. So one of the few collections for which that is true is we just borrowed 1,500 specimens from Inbio. That's a big collection in Costa Rica and they have a really nice database and they can actually export all the data and give it to you. On the other hand, it also goes obviously the, uh, the other way around. So when we're working on our big revisionary projects, we not only want to make sure that we make the data available in databases, but we export all the data into Excel spreadsheet and again, send it back to the institutions where we borrow the specimens from so they can use that for their own purposes. Okay, so the solutions to all these, you know, collection challenges really. Um, not a silver bullet, but uh, something that would benefit us all, obviously, is our digitiza digitization initiatives. And it would be specimens and in particular, obviously, types. So when you look at a museum, again, looking at, you know, African-focused research projects, and I work on, on African um, red wheels quite a bit, so those are very important for me. So the museum in Paris has been talking a lot about um, specimen capture 
databases and initiatives, they've been become involved in GBIF quite some time ago, um, and they're working on things, but it's not going quite as, as fast as some of us obviously would like to see it. And then the same is true for the Natural History Museum, where just the number of specimens is just so amazing that getting things prioritized is a real big problem. And tomorrow or on, on Wednesday, we're going to be seeing some of the solutions that some of these museums are, are taking to that whole dilemma. Okay, so this is a solution that came up um, very briefly before and we saw the you know, problems and, and benefits of these whole drawer imaging initiatives as I want to call them. We saw exactly the same picture before as well. Um, works really quite well for small insects um, where you can, well in this case it's sort of a little questionable because obviously some of the label data are different here so you have to piece that together. But if you want to digitize your lab collection, Lepidoptera collection, obviously you're, you know, you're in pain because the labels are tiny and they're covered. So we're going to be talking about that in, with more detail um, tomorrow or on Wednesday. Okay, there's um, some other brilliant initiatives out there that again are brilliant but haven't really kind of gotten into the, the action we would like to see yet. Um, there's a remote type imaging initiative. The idea there is to put these, it's essentially a little robot with a camera, into the museums in London, Paris, and Washington. And then you remotely could, once a technical staff has put the actual insect specimen into a holder somewhere in here, you can remotely steer the camera to take pictures from all the angles you want to have pictures taken. So you go, wow, this is absolutely fantastic and brilliant, and we should definitely have that. There were apparently um, quite, quite um, some technical problems with that, and the prototype uh, is running in Washington, but there's still some, some problems with that. So the, um, the remote imaging parts in London and Paris, I think they're not functioning yet. But you know, there's hope, so this might come at some point. Okay, so in summary, biologic collections, very important, need support. Um, there's funding constraints, that's the same thing everywhere. Um, you have to embrace biodiversity informatics to uncover that data, that's very obviously. I would also argue that every collection counts, so it's not only the big collections that should do all the data capture, there's very valuable information in some smaller collections as well. And then in the end, um, the, um, the possibilities of data aggregations have become such that it has become fairly straightforward to really effectively combine data from many, many collections and many databases. So the whole question about which database should I be using, it's not that much of a problem anymore than it was, I would say, five or six <coughs> years ago. And here a picture from a fairly small but really nicely curated insect collection at the IITA in Yaounde as a local example. Okay, okay um, very briefly to new specimen data, um, biodiversity inventory, so you can tell from that map, so those are the collecting localities we've been to since um, 2007, so we do like to spend a lot of time in the field, not only in museums, and this is just because you know, it's fun, it's interesting, it's exciting, and obviously we always come up with good arguments why we're why we're doing field work. Um, the question is, and this is something you always have to justify, obviously, to the, your money, um, the organizations that fund to is why spend more time and money in the field if we don't even know what's in our collections? And obviously, um, field work is, it's a lot of fun, but also it's not always fun. So this is a picture from a colleague of mine who's done a lot of field work in Madagascar and he likes to get stuck in the mud and swim his car through rivers and everything. And this is one of my former grad students who got stuck in the mud and, and uh, doing field work in Borneo. So it's a challenge. So why are we doing that really? Okay, so we can say in many cases, based on species richness estimations, but then also based on what we know from biogeographic er other biogeographic areas with similar climate or plant diversity, for example, or using specialized collecting techniques, that there's a lot of biodiversity out there that we very likely actually have not really captured in collections yet in the most effective way. 
so the argument we use in that plant bug, um, planetary biodiversity inventory is that we knew the fauna in the Mediterranean and actually in California relatively well at least are really extremely diverse and the climates and also the, um, fornist, uh, the floristic composition in Western Australia and South Africa are fairly similar in being extremely diverse having similar climates so we said there must be a lot more species out there and this is where we focused our field work and similar for um, that new project I'm working on leaf litter bugs and that's them they're really tiny this is 0.2 millimeters so the entire thing is only one millimeter long and this is obviously in part why they're really under sample because no one really looks at things that are that tiny. So we started sampling in Africa and we found that each sample from each new locality has undescribed species in it. And that starts being actually really scary <laughs> because we don't know how many hundreds of species we'll have to describe. Okay, so there are um, alternative approaches. So what we're typically doing in my lab is targeted field work for taxonomic revisions. Um, so they're really small scale, which means they're logistically small scale, they're financially feasible. But then also the problem is obviously the impact in terms of knowing biodiversity and getting biodiversity data out there is fairly small, of course. And then there are the ATBIs versus the ABTIs. Um, ATBI stands for All Taxon Biodiversity Inventory, and that means that someone goes into an area um, and looks at a large number of taxa. It could be all of arthropods, all of, you know, all of animals or whatever. Um, in a specific area, um, signature projects in the insect world were um, two projects in Costa Rica, in Guanacaste and La Selva. La Selva, see the web page down here, it's known as, as Alice Project. And then you have the alternative, the all biodiversity taxon inventory, where you would only focus on one specific taxon or a small group of species or a relatively small group of species, and you would look at them in a larger geographic um, area. And these planetary biodiversity inventories, as they were funded by the US National Science Foundation, were examples for this. For example, one focusing on tiny little spiders in Australia and a few other areas. <coughs> okay, and, and I want to just very, very briefly introduce um, three projects that um, I thought were very interesting in the ways they were approaching things, they were integrated training and international collaborations, and also they cover three biogeographic regions. The project LAMA um, that was led by Jack Longino and Bob Anderson is in um, Mesoamerica. Then there's a the uh, Madagascar arthropod biodiversity project by Brian Fisher and Charles Griswold that's been going on for more than 12 years by now. And then you have a project that was called Thailand, uh, Tiger Thailand Inventory Group for Entomological Research led by Mike Sharkey and Brian Brown. And those three projects were really um, you know, very influential and very data rich projects of all. Okay, so TIGER is a collaborative terrestrial arthropod survey, as I said, um, it's a very important area. There's two hot, uh, biodiversity hotspots that are covered in, in Thailand. This project in particular looked at specialized collecting techniques, like big passive trapping techniques, malaise traps, pan traps, those are little yellow dishes with soapy water in them that you can very cheaply collect a lot of bugs. And leaf litter samples were important. Um, what was really great in this project was there were really enthusiastic collaborators in Thailand. Um, there was a lot of student training and following up on Town's earlier comments that you really have to involve um, students in, in these projects and really you know, work with them very closely, keep them as grad students um, involved um, to make a real impact. Um, what was exceptional about this project was the size